The Tibetan Plateau is one of the world's most inhospitable regions. And yet, Tibetan populations have been thriving there for millennia. Despite the extreme cold and low oxygen levels at high altitudes, people have managed to not just permanently settle on the plateau, but to establish dynasties, carve the powerful Tibetan Empire, construct imposing monuments, and flourish in the arts. And to make things even more fascinating, DNA studies tell us that Tibetans today share a unique genetic heritage, some of which includes DNA from a ghost population. This ghost signature kept geneticists baffled for years, but now the latest archaeogenetic research is inching us one step closer to understanding who these ghost ancestors were. I'm Madam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I'll explore the genetics of the fascinating Tibetan Plateau populations, with a specific focus on their ghost ancestry, what we've learned about them, what we still have to learn, and the plot twist nobody was expecting, alongside a unique gene they carry that's helped them thrive at high altitudes. And you may be surprised to find out who it comes from. Ancient DNA has provided us with key insights into the genetic history of people living on the massive Tibetan Plateau. Tibetan populations today show strong links to the plateau's ancient past, sharing a distinctive and unique Tibetan ancestry that has been present on the plateau from at least as early as 5,100 years ago, probably longer. This Tibetan signature is mainly characterized by ancestry related to what we call ancient Northern East Asians. But there's another component derived from a deeply diverged and mysterious ghost population. A ghost population refers to a group of people whose existence has been uncovered through the statistical analysis of ancient or modern DNA, where they have left genetic traces. Essentially, we know that this group once existed because they have left a genetic signature, and we can estimate what percentage of their DNA lives on in later populations, but we haven't actually directly identified this population through skeletal remains. Deeply diverged, meanwhile, means that a genetic lineage split from other lineages a very, very long time ago. We're talking tens of thousands of years ago or more in this context. Divergence refers to the accumulation of genetic changes or mutations between populations, usually due to a lack of gene flow. When enough changes have accumulated, populations diverge or split, becoming distinct. And so when a population or lineage is defined as deeply diverged, it means that it separated a really long time ago and has remained distinct. This deeply diverged signal in the Tibetans can't be explained by them carrying any extra ancestry from Neanderthals or Denisovans because archaeogenetic studies have shown that ancient Tibetans didn't harbor any elevated amounts of archaic, or non-anatomically modern human ancestry. We are almost certainly dealing with a very ancient ghost anatomically modern human lineage. And although some regional and temporal nuances are present within the shared Tibetan genetic heritage, for example, contributions of South and Central Asian ancestry have been detected in some ancient samples from the western and southern parts of the plateau, this ghost signature both shows up in ancient individuals sampled from sites across the plateau and constitutes up to 20% of the present-day Tibetan gene pool. And what's even more fascinating, out of all the present-day populations sampled and studied to date, this mysterious ghost population seems to have only left a detectable trace in populations from the Tibetan Plateau. A study from 2023 suggested that this ancestry is related, but not identical, to the ancestry seen in one or more of the following other deeply diverged samples. A 45,000-year-old Ust Ishim individual from Siberia, a 40,000-year-old Tian Yuan individual from northern China, and present-day Andamanese islanders. However, lacking any direct samples from an individual that actually belonged to this ghost population made any further characterization difficult. That is, until now. Thanks to new archaeogenetic research, we're finally starting to understand who these ghost ancestors were. This recent paper, titled Prehistoric Genomes from Yunnan Reveal Ancestry Related to Tibetans and Austroasiatic Speakers, found something very interesting in the DNA of a female from the Xingyi archaeological site who lived roughly 7,000 years ago. She was buried in what is today Yunnan province, located close to the Tibetan Plateau. Her genetics revealed that she belonged to a previously unsampled, deeply diverged Asian lineage, and the researchers found that this lineage is related to the ghost component harbored by the Tibetans. The researchers labeled this basal Asian Xingyi ancestry, and they estimated its divergence to have taken place at least 40,000 years ago. Using a statistical tool called Cupiatum, which tests for admixture and estimates ancestry proportions, we call different ancestral combinations models, it was found that the only model that worked for explaining the ancestry of the Tibetan Plateau populations was a mixture of Northern East Asian-related and Basal Asian Xingyi-related ancestries, suggesting that a population very closely related to the population to which the Xingyi individual belonged contributed that ghost signature to ancient and modern plateau populations. 
This is a major DNA breakthrough. We finally have a sample that represents the deeply diverged ghost lineage. Case closed, right? Well, what if I told you that it's possible that another ghost population also contributed its DNA to the Tibetan Plateau populations? Another tool employed in this study showed that while part of the ancestry of populations across the Tibetan Plateau was related to the ancestry seen in the Xinyi individual, another model where there was additional ancestry from another ghost population unrelated to Xinyi was also possible. So now we have to ask, how many deeply diverged populations are we dealing with? This can only be answered by getting many more ancient samples from across East and North Asia and comparing them to ancient and modern Tibetan Plateau populations. I will, of course, keep you updated if any new discoveries are announced. But focusing just on the basal Asian Xinyi related ancestry, the lineage we have finally identified, a few new questions emerge. The Xinyi individual obviously wasn't the only one harboring basal Asian Xinyi ancestry. More of her population and closely related populations existed and they need to be sampled. And it would be great to establish the geographic range of individuals harboring basal Asian Xinyi or basal Asian Xinyi related ancestry. I'm especially curious if any settled on the Tibetan Plateau and then contributed their DNA directly to later Plateau populations, and that admixture with later populations harboring ancient Northern East Asian-related ancestry took place directly on the Plateau. Currently, the oldest sample from the Tibetan Plateau that we've studied genomically dates to 5100 BP, and in this sample, we see that the shared Tibetan genetic signature was already present on the Plateau at that time. However, this individual was not the first person on the Plateau, not by a long shot. Anatomically modern humans have been present there from as early as 30 to 40,000 years ago at least. But whether these early inhabitants are the ancestors of the later plateau populations is currently unknown. Whether this ghost ancestry comes directly from the plateau's Paleolithic inhabitants, who mixed on the plateau with populations harboring ancient northern East Asian ancestry, needs testing with more ancient samples. That another ghost population could have contributed their DNA to the populations of the Tibetan plateau also complicates the story, but makes it all the more interesting. And a final question I have is, what happened that led to basal Asian Xingyi related ancestry to only be found in traceable amounts today, to the best of our knowledge, in the populations of the Tibetan Plateau? That's the thing with ancient DNA, and all other scientific fields really, that no matter how many puzzles you solve, or get close to solving, you find yourself asking many, many new questions. At this point, you're probably wondering how the inhabitants of the Tibetan Plateau have been able to live at such high altitudes and for such a long period of time. The comfort zone of a lowlander is maximum 2,500 meters above sea level, but the Tibetan Plateau has parts that go to more than 4,000 meters above sea level. At such high altitudes, the low atmospheric pressure can induce a condition known as hypoxia, this is when the body or a specific part of the body doesn't get enough oxygen, and this condition can obviously be life-threatening. However, Tibetan populations are well adapted to high-altitude life, and the ultimate reason why is because they carry beneficial genes. The best studied of these genes is abbreviated EPS1, and Tibetan plateau populations carry a haplotype here that helps their bodies adapt to low oxygen levels. A haplotype is a set of alleles located close together on the same chromosome that tend to be inherited together. But what's very interesting about the specific EPS1 haplotype is that it came from the Denisovans, extinct hominins who seem to have lived primarily in East Asia and Siberia and, just like their close cousins the Neanderthals, contributed a bit of their DNA to some modern human populations. Ancient DNA has allowed us to tentatively trace this adaptive haplotype selection over time. We've been able to go back about 5,000 years. Our old sample, dated to 5100 BP, carried two copies of the adapted haplotype. Remember, since you get 50% of your DNA from your mother and 50% from your father, you harbor two copies of a gene. Sometimes both copies you inherit are the same, sometimes they're different, and in this case, the oldest Tibetan genome sequence to date harbored two copies of the adaptive haplotype. Tracing samples across time, researchers found that the adaptive haplotype has increased in frequency over the last 3,000 years, with a sharp increase just in the past 700. If you look at this graph here, we can see the frequency of the adaptive haplotype over time. Those with a blue circle carry two copies of the adaptive haplotype, those with a white circle none, and those with half blue half white circles carried one copy of it. It's clear that the adaptive haplotype has been under selection for a long time. How did the populations of the Tibetan Plateau come to acquire the Denisovan direct EPAS1 haplotype? Well, this is another puzzle that still needs solving. The Xingyi individual didn't harbor any copies of the adaptive haplotype, and so this could mean either that the population to which she belonged carried a diverse set of haplotypes, 
and she just happened to be one individual in the population that didn't carry the adaptive version, or since part of the ghost ancestry harbored by plateau populations could have come partially from another population unrelated to basal Asian Xingyi, it could be that that as an unsampled population contributed the adaptive Epus 1 haplotype. Since the adaptive haplotype is derived from Denisovans, it could have easily come from a deeply diverged Paleolithic population that was living on the plateau, who then admixed with individuals carrying basal Asian Xingyi related ancestry and people carrying ancient Northern East Asian related ancestry. We'll only have a clearer picture once more ancient genomes have been sequenced. Still, this is a great example of just how adaptable humans are and how our genes have allowed us to achieve the unachievable. That's it for this episode. As usual, if you have any thoughts, feel free to leave a comment, subscribe for more cool content by our go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.